Hello. Hi, Rob. Mark. Hey, Mark. How you doing, sir? I'm doing good, buddy. Where are you calling me from? Finland. Oh, you're in Finland. Okay. Yes, we were uh, at a festival today. So, uh, did you say you're playing today, or are you played, or what? No, we're going on in about an hour and a half, I guess. So. Oh, okay. Well, we're um, we've got a day off today. In fact, we just got into this place called Malmo, which is about an oh, hour. Oh, I've been there. I actually spent hour, uh, yeah, spent some hour time away there. from Sweden, rock so. I actually got I'll a tattoo be, uh, in Malmo. It's a nice yeah, tattoo yeah. shop down there. And we're at the Radisson, so it's a nice place to Very relax cool. and recharge the batteries for the show tomorrow. Yeah, I hear that one. All righty. So, you want to begin? Because uh, I know your I'm time ready, is brother. limited. Yeah, so I'm ready to go whenever you are, yeah. I'm recording on this end, so everything should uh, be good to go. Okay. Do you so, want to test it to make sure it's working okay? Um, uh, yeah, we've we've tested it a few times already just oh, okay. to make sure things are recording, and it's and we're backing it up on a uh, cell phone as well. Yeah. So, so we got actually two two units recording at the same time. So I think we'll be covered. Ah, you see, well, hey. you see, you're, you're you're a professional. You know what it's like when you. Well, we, I'm sure you've done interviews in the past yes. where, you know, at the end of the interview, the guy goes, "Oh, I forgot to press record." Yeah, right. <laughs> Tough titty, mate. I hear that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, let's kick it off, sir, because I know you've got work to do, so... Alrighty, so uh, I, mean, I want to start with a, a two-part question, okay? Yeah. This first part yeah. is, you, you've been singing professionally now for 40-some years. How yeah. in the hell do you manage to keep your throat, your, your voice, in such great shape? Um, I mean, I've never seen you have a... I've never seen you had a bad night, and I've seen you sing in the old days, in the mid-80s, and in just as recently as the other day. And you never seem to to miss a note. Well, it's an interesting question because, as you know, all singers have different um, techniques and, and different styles. And I suppose, much like any other instrument, it's just how I've learned to use it over the years. So, a song like Painkiller, which which does sound and look pretty intense right I, I can get through that n not with any great ease but because I know what to do um, right. I'm able to kind of get the performance from it every night but I've got to tell you I don't think there's a show that I've ever done where I've come off stage going I nailed this I got it 100% there's always something for me because I'm a perfectionist, where yeah. I go, oh fuck, what you know that it, that was the bump. Now my voice was my voice was was a bit rough, and I wanted it to be smooth. Because right. as you know, we're, we're at the mercy, aren't we, of, of touring? I mean, the voice is affected by so many things. Indeed. Um, so you never know. But I, I don't do anything, Mark. I mean, I, I um, warm up routines, cool downs. No, I don't. I don't do any of that. But I think I think I've I think I, I, I realise now at this point that it's best for me to save it until I start belting it out. Because if I warm up, you know, before a show, right. the chances are that I'm not going to be able to do things that I want to do a bit later on. I mean, you, you can you can serve your energy, don't you? I think I think yeah. on, any, on any good day when I'm touring, I, I can get I can get just under two hours of of solid work from it. Um, anything over that, I, I think it's pushing it uh, for me, and, and especially at, at this point in my life, you know, sixty-four yeah. year old metalhead, and my voice has changed. It has, I know it has, compared to. The, 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 the notes I could hit clearly and, and the top end all those years ago. Right. It's impossible to replicate it now, but I think we just go out there yeah, and do, do a the damn good job of it. Can. Yeah, as long, as long as the song's recognizable and you're going for the notes and, and the fans well, that, can see that, that brings that's me, all you not can to ask. cut you off, but that brings me to the second part of this question is what what is it that, when there's so many singers out there of of you know advanced age that are content to walk on the stage and not go for the high notes let the audience sing the hard mm. parts and just kind of mouth through it but you still go out there and deliver for a lack of a better term deliver the goods 
and what, what possesses what what drives you to do that? Uh, when you probably okay, well, don't think, have to, they would I'm come all, anyway. Yeah. I'm, sorry, go on. <laughs> I'm just saying you probably don't even have to because they would come see you anyway. Yeah, I, I think that if you're going to do these songs like Vitamin Changes or Painkiller or, or anything that's got some extreme top ending, you've got to go for it, otherwise why put it in the set? Great. I, 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 you know, I, I, uh, I, I don't. that wouldn't work for me to hand it over to the crowd. I, I'm there to work. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> you know? I understand. I'm there, to, I'm there to do it. But again, as you probably know, Mark, when we put a set list together, we all sit down together, I'm sure, do you, yeah. what you do with your band, and you kind of go through the motions of what you're going to kick it off with, your first two or three songs, and then you're into your set and you're grooving along up through the middle bit. Uh-oh, did Skype just quit on us? Rob, you still there? With Dragonaut. When we start with Dragonaut, which is a relatively simple song to sing, that's my, I'm warming up through that through that section, and then Metal Gods, I'm I'm, I'm kind of picking up the the speed and 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 then aiming for that third song, right. uh, Devil's Child, which has got a, some high stuff in it. So by the time I get to the third song, I'm usually I'm usually good to go. Yeah, uh, and, I, I and, find but, that true as well a lot of times. Yeah, yeah, I mean. I, I I don't think I could I couldn't kick it off with painkiller. Pain, I need to be really really loose and warmed up to do painkiller. And, yeah, as and you, you know, end up we doing do it, damage when you do that too. Yeah, you you, you, well, you, yeah, you, you you've got to be careful because I mean, I, I also this do do you use those in ear monitors, Mark? No, I don't. You don't. Well, I'll, I'll just tell you this quick story about who introduced me to those. It was Sebastian. Many, many years ago, I went and seen Sebastian opening up for Van Halen in Phoenix. And he was, gonna go, he was going on stage. This was the very early stages of in ear monitors. And he, I said, what are those things in your ears? He goes, oh, man. Do you guys have these men that are amazing? <laughs> and so he found me a pair of his. And he said, you listen to my mix that the monitor guy is giving me. And just tell me what you think. Well, of course... I could hear everything. I could hear the hi hat, the kick drum. I could hear the bass. Everything was coming through like you were listening to it, like a stereo CD or whatever. And I'm like, God, these are amazing. I said, but don't de detach from the crowd. And he goes, Well, for me, it's just it's a bit of a trade off. I mean, I yeah. love to hear the crowd. I do as well. I'm driven by the crowd. However, we use uh, two live mics. ambient mics. Either side of the stage, and then right. one behind Scott. So the finish is on where the crowd is joining in. I can hear everything they're doing. So what I'm getting to is this bit about when, when I used to blow my voice out, and I used to be quite regularly in the 70s, the 80s, and, and the 90s to some extent. I'd have a good run, and then you know for two or three days it would be really difficult. So it was these in ear monitors. It's been a lifesaver. It really has. So now, even though I'm still belting it out, I don't have to push myself to hear that certain note because I was right. fighting against the guitars or whatever. I can hear, I can hear it, hear everything well enough. There's a bit of a comfort factor, you know, where I can kind of relax. I can do the song and hear everything. And also for me, it's 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 like this critical point of. Of being confident because if I'm if I if I don't have that confidence when I walk out, I'm just I, it's just shit for me. Yeah, I know. I, have I, to feel, I, I hear that one. <laughs> yeah, I just have to feel confident for a right I walk out on stage, and I still like the nervous the nervous vibe. I, I don't think I've ever walked on stage completely and utterly relaxed and calm. Right. I start getting psyched up as soon as I start getting dressed. And as I'm walking to that stage, it's like going into the ring, you know. You, sure you it just, is. You, you just want to do the best you can do for your band and for yep. your fans. And, and, it's, and it's live, all to, that. live for another It's all day. that, isn't it, Mark? It's a head job, really. It's just so much head job. It's all, it's all, the, it's, it's all the stuff that, that's going on in our brains to make 
the best performance that we can, that we can give. Understood. Understood. Am I breaking up on your end at all? No, yeah, I'm, I'm hearing you fine. Okay, you good. Might, oh, oh, oh. I lost you for a second, but I got we pretty much got the whole gist of what was going on there. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, Unleashed in the East. Yeah, was the first Judas Priest album that I ever had, and yeah. I wore the freaking grooves off of it. Right, uh, right. Went back and got the older albums afterwards, but still to this day, I think probably one of the greatest and sonically great heavy metal live recordings ever. Do you remember anything about how it was recorded? I mean, did they bring out ADATs, or did you actually travel with two-inch tape? It, it, in time, it's going to... Now you're breaking up. Ah, oh, this internet. Rob, are you still there? Hello? Hello? Now I got you. You got me? Yeah. Yeah, that, that came as a surprise, Mark, because the label came to a ball brought to her and said, um, would, you, would you do a live record for Japan? And we were kind of surprised. We said, well, yeah, we'll record, us, we'll record the shows and we'll, we'll check it out later. So... It was it was the first time that I that I think a metal band had, had made a live recording. I believe so, particularly in Japan. And um, when word got out through the label and elsewhere that, that this was you know about to hit, there was just this big um, big reaction to, to giving it um, a, an international release, which was exciting for us because it's very difficult to capture the the, the, the live performance of the band because there's so many things going on right but I mean when I when I listen to it now it, this just, it just it, there's just a magic there you know, there's just the magic of the night the performance it was all of the interaction you know everything was just clicking and you, it's hit and miss when you make a live recording isn't it you, you just don't know whether you're going to get it or not but um, it's such to, to, of course, that was the kickoff really for Japan for Japanese metal and, and hard rock. We were one of the first bands that went there. Yeah, and uh, so it's a it was a magic an exciting, time. Uh, it's an exciting piece of music. Yeah, we've done other live recordings besides that one, but it's just that particular one, isn't it? Uh, there's just something special about it. I can't quite explain it, but uh, we're just glad to to have it, you know, preserved forever. Um, two of the songs. On that album, or covers, yeah. Reman Alishi, which yeah. I mean, they're both recorded earlier, but yeah. Reman yeah. Alishi, which was written by Peter Green, yes, for, for Fleetwood Mac. And if yeah. you go back and listen to the old Fleetwood Mac recording, you can right. definitely see yeah. where you guys got that from. I mean, it was so dark yeah. and eerie to begin with. It was, yeah. it made perfect sense. The one right. for me is Diamonds and Rust, which was yeah. a Joan Baez ballad. How did you yeah. ever in the hell come up with the idea of turning that into the masterpiece you made out of it? Well, well again, you... Oh, now I lost you. you. Hello, hello, testing one, two, three. There you are, hello, good. Hello. Got it. Yeah, the label came to us and said, look, things are starting to happen for you in America, but we really need something for the radio. Oh. Um, and we've never written anything for the radio, in all honesty. All those songs that happen, like Breaking the Law, Living After Midnight, you know, another thing coming, they just they just happened to turn out the way that they were and they connected to the radio. But in this instance, the label said, we've got a song for you, we're going to send it over, we'd like you to listen to it and we'd like you to give your interpretation. I'll, I'll never forget the day because we sent a 45, you know, a 45 single, we put it on the record player and we heard Joan, it was just Joan. Yeah, with an acoustic guitar, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful song. It is a beautiful and we, song. And we thought, is this a wind-up? Are they like, you know... So many verses in that oh, darn song, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. What we learned right there, and like she wrote, will take any kind of interpretation. So um, I, they did just, you repeat that, Rob? I was they just wanted waking up. Yeah, we've always felt that any any good song, any good song of quality, will take any type of interpretation. Right. You know, and you can hear that now if you go on the internet. There are yeah. there are these 
these noobs, as I call them, right. that mess around with your songs and they make a like like a you know like a funk version or a, or a you know that, that so with that with that idea we said let's just see what we can do and we just played it straight as a band you know two two guitars bass drums and vocals sent it back and they were really happy with it and it did get some airplay so that really started the idea of looking for other material yeah. and as you know we did peter green we did uh, spooky tooth and yeah. um, a couple of people by but um it was it was just a very interesting um, exercise, and and as musicians, in, in making think, someone else's music, your yeah, own. yeah. As musicians, um, we we learn something. We learn something there that that a great song will will take any kind of interpretation. That's great. Okay, I got this. Is a good one. Um, in 1984, I was at the infamous Madison Square Garden show where the oh, really? city got destroyed. I was <laughs> yeah. on the floor sitting yeah. about halfway back in the floor seats. Yeah. I saw something come flying past my head. Yeah. And I go, what the hell was that? I thought it was a Frisbee or a beach ball, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I saw people in front of me turning around and, and looking yeah. with these wide, gaping eyes. Yeah. And I turned around <laughs> and looked into the stadium and saw yeah. uh, what looked like to be giant snowflakes coming yes. down out of the sky, which was actually the yes. cushions from the seats. That's it. So, That's it. I mean, I, I was going, you got to be fucking kidding me. Yes. What in the hell were you guys thinking on stage? I can't yes. imagine. Well, it, it was, I can, st when you talk about it, I can, I can see it in my mind's eye because, you know, that yeah, stage, I can too. you couldn't see the stage by the end of that song. The stage was covered it was like this big giant trampoline, you know, giant like a marshmallow. big fucking, yeah. <laughs> we couldn't even, we, you know, we couldn't even one day. I think the feeling was, this was history in the making. <laughs> this yeah. was rock and roll history in the making. We hoped that it wouldn't escalate to a possible another level where people yeah. would be hurting each other. We exactly. never, ever, ever want that. We so we said afterwards that was just the ultimate display of fanaticism Oof. and and passion and energy, you know, controlled aggressive energy, and we were grateful that it happened in the building yeah. rather than spilling out yes. into yeah. Midtown and creating havoc, you know, yeah, and. We, we've we've, said, too much we've said then, we'll say now, we never condone that kind of thing. We never encourage that kind of thing. But it was impossible to stop. Yeah. It was impossible, oh, wasn't it? Yeah. It just happened for like three minutes. The place went mental. But uh, anyway, you know. <laughs> the, the, I, don't know whether you, I don't know whether you heard the follow-up story about that sometime later. I heard when, it was about $250,000 worth of damage. Yeah, there was. And the insurance covered that for the garden. Thank but um, the side story to that was that um, a few months, about a year or so later, because we were banned from the garden, I think we still are, um, <laughs> we, we, uh, Ken and Glenn went to see Vetus Garolitis and John McEnroe, the tennis players who right. were rock, rock and roll, mm -hmm. you know, maniacs. They invited them to the game. So Ken and Glenn were sitting there, you know, with the baseball caps on with the head right. down. And one of the ushers came over and go, are you guys some Judas Priest? And I went, who, us? Uh, what? You, you got the wrong guys. He goes, no, 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 it is you. He goes, hey, we do some things because we've been trying to get those seats replaced in the garden for years and years and years. And management wouldn't put any new seats in. So, they, the so they were happy about it. But after <laughs> that was kind of happy about it afterwards. Yeah, oh it's probably, my gosh, uh, that's insane. <laughs> nuts, absolutely nuts. Um, are you? Can you hear me still? Go okay. Yeah, I got you yeah. fine. I got you loud and clear. Yeah. Okay, you're breaking up a yeah. little bit once in a while, but so uh, speaking of of Ken and uh, Glenn and Ian and yourself, I mean, the four of you have been together. You've been the nucleus of this band pretty much forever. 
Um, how is it now playing with Richie as as the new uh, the new guy? Is it, how is the chemistry? I mean, it, it it seems great to me on stage. I mean, you guys play yeah. Well, I, I think I think your answer is, is there, Mark. You know, Richie. He doesn't have to prove himself anymore. No. You know, when, when you bring a new guy in, they've really got to prove something. Oh, I know. <laughs> they got, well, you know, yeah. And and that, that's just the way it is. Yeah. And you've got to get the fans with you. And it's like when you stood out on that stage with that set night after night, you were winning the fans over. And that's what Richie has did, and, he, and he's still doing to some extent. Sure. I mean, he's been in the band now about, what, three or four years, probably longer. But, but um, still the new guy, nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, still the new guy. But um, it's great, isn't it? I mean, yeah. Yeah. if it's making the band work and you're connecting and it sounds good and it looks good, that's all that matters. And that's not being disrespectful to KK. I'm it's sure no, you feel no. the same I, way. I think at the end of the day... Judo. It's about the music yeah. more than anything, you know. Yeah, I think at the heart of it, the fans go, that's, that's my band. I just want to hear those songs. Mm -hmm. I want to see my band. Me. I want to have a great night out. That's all that matters. And I think that's what's, what's happening with Richie. But he brings a new dimension to Priest, like you brought a new dimension to accept, you know. Oh, and like Ripper did when he brought a new dimension to Priest when I was away. You know, there has to be a little bit of a dynamic shift and change that I think is important. Yeah. And um, and and, it, and, it, and it's it's magic, you know. So Richie's at the helm now with with Glenn on the guitars, nailing it night after night, and uh, you know, Sounds killer. It, it's a good feeling. It's a good feeling. Do you have any uh, any plans to do anything with Fight or uh, or or Halford or? Too? Well, it's funny because, you know, occasionally I listen to that stuff, like if we're on a flight, if we're on a long flight, doing the long hauls, right. you know, when you're sitting there for fucking 10 hours in a tube in the sky, oh, yeah. um, you just listen to a lot of stuff, and that's what I do, listen to music and watch some movies, and when I, when I listen to that stuff, I, I do get excited, it's a lot of memories, sure, again, it to a different they're, place. Good, they're good tunes, they're good tunes. And all I'll say on, on that level is, is, like I've always said, the most important thing in my life musically, and I get a lot of satisfaction Good. out of praise more than ever now. But having said that, um, if there was an opportunity, if I'm permitted, and if there was, you know, if there was a, a solid enough uh, purpose to go out and do some. Rob, still there. As you know, much like except, except takes up all your time because that's your band. You're always working. If you're not working, you're writing. If you're not writing, you're recording. And a year goes by, and a year goes by, and a year exactly. goes by. So we're not getting case, any younger yeah. either. Yeah, it's just a case case of wait and see. But right. I, but I would I would like to or just to, you know kick the tires on it I again mean, and, and see what what could happen. War War of Words was, was another album that I listened to religiously when it came out. Mm. Nailed to the Gun was one of my all time faves. Just a, just a great track, man. All, oh, all well, those tracks thank were you. great. I was just inspired by the new movement that was happening in metal yeah. at that time. Sure. There was a ton of great new sounds coming through from the extremes of like Pantera right. to Navarre. But you, you still stayed true to who you are. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't like you true. changed, shifted That's gears, you know, and got into a, a, a whole different scene. Yeah, I think I, it was very, you know, very much I, I, like Priest, I think, but just to another <clears throat> another uh, dimension. Well, what, what I, what I, the exercise I set for myself was if I could write songs by myself. I'd never done that before. Right. And I did it all on guitar. Very good guitar player, but I can play guitar enough just to get the riffs down, you know. Right. And I, I did all, I did all of, I did all of the War of Words album in my bedroom of my house in Phoenix. It took me about two weeks to put the songs together, and then of course it took a lot longer to actually, you know, find the band and record it. But, but that, but that was for me, for me as a musician. I think much like yourself, probably, if, if, if there's something that you want to try and do, you, it, you know, because it's one life, isn't it? And and you, you, if there's an opportunity, if you, 
if you search in something or if you interested in doing something, what is it to stop you? You know, nothing. There's nothing worse than having a dream and not not trying to fulfil it. That's, yeah. That's how that's how I've always felt. So for and then that regret exercise, it later. yeah, for that exercise with the fight record, once we got the first record out, it was it was a lot of a lot of satisfaction and and, and again gives you gives you a bit of a kick and gives you a bit of confidence that sure. you can do something like that. Do you that think? At this point, a lot of people are, you know, saying it's not worth making new albums anymore. Do you do you think it's still a, a worthwhile process making the actually putting out a record, or you I think, do. You think I you're do. better Absolutely. off touring on your past glory, like a lot of people do? Yeah, I, I think we need to do it. I think we need to do it. Except it's got enough records that you could you guys can go out and, and not not need to write any new music but you do. Yeah. Priest is Priest is in the same situation. Because as musicians that that's what's that's that's how we that's got to where do. we are. We got to where we are by writing, you know, mm-hmm. recording and checking it out and going that's I pretty think good. The, the creative process is almost as time. much fun as the live performance. You know? Exactly. I think I think the big dilemma is how bands, particularly new, young bands, how they're able to make a living out of that process yeah. now, because it's difficult, isn't it? Yes. It's really difficult, because everybody fucking steals it. And then you get a lot of young kids that say, I'm not going to pay for it, I'm just going to watch it off YouTube, or, or get it from here and there yeah. and everywhere. So the economics, the economics of putting a new band together and getting your music listened to and people buy it and giving you a few dollars to put sure. back in the band. It's really hard work now. And there's so many of them. But, yeah, but I think it's very, very important that no matter what band you're in, you test yourself, you see what you're capable of doing, you know. And that's why Priest is going to make another record after a deal with Souls. We don't need to. But we want to. Yeah. We genuinely want to do another record because we had the blast making Redeemer of Souls. So you just do it, don't you, man? It's just what we do. If we're a band. You're in a rock and roll band. You, you write songs. You, you play them out live, and that's what that's what it is. I have to agree. I yeah. Definitely have to agree with that one. Um. I don't want to keep you much longer, Rob, because we're going on a half That's hour. okay, Mark. Yeah, we'll have like another five, five or ten minutes. Should you just uh? Well, do you have any advice for these up-and-coming bands, especially young singers? What, what would you say to them? I think the first thing you should try and strive to get out of being in a band is that feeling, that, that magic that happens when you're jamming in the garage or the rehearsal space. And, you know, you're all playing together and something's happening that's really exciting, that gives you a buzz, gives you right. gives you the energy, gives you the passion, you know? I think if it starts at that level and you're enjoying it and having a good time with it, then you've got to do everything that you can to keep that close to your heart. Like, I've done so many shows with Priest, I've lost count now, but I get the biggest kick in the fucking world when I go out with my band and I start singing I, 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 it's never it's never le- it's never left me never gets tired does it, it I've never I've never got never felt not, never felt tired of it never felt oh fucking it's breaking the law for the billion time never felt no, that and, ever. and the fans never let you down that's, yes, that's the fa- and that's that is really the heart of the matter again we we can't exist without our fans. No. Our fans are, are our inspiration. It's our fans that inspire us to to keep doing what we do. So it's it's the fans um, that, that you gain even when you're a brand new band. I can remember those early days of Priest when we play a club and there'd be three people there. Yeah, three people, but they'd be banging their heads. <laughs> you know. And then that's how oh, you making a record. Yeah, I'll gotta get. I'll come and see you next show. That's how it starts. It's a beautiful thing, really, isn't it, Mark? It is. So it's still. So is. I, I would say I, I would say to any young band, 
Firstly, try and get as much joy and pleasure as you can out of your own band and being with each other, being a band of brothers, the girls in the bands now, you know. It's everybody believing in the dream, fighting for the dream, making the dream real. You know, the very simple, simple aspects of being a band are I just that. Nice. They only become cluttered. They only become challenging. They only become difficult when you become more successful. And it becomes because a suddenly business. you've got to change, haven't you? You've got to be a businessman. You've got to do contracts. Yeah. You've got to be here, there, interviews, blah, 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 blah. You've got to be able to carry all the extra baggage and still wait for that moment when you go out and play your heart out with your band because that's what you want to do. Crazy, man. All right, so we'll, let's close. I have just one quick thing. Gene Simmons says metal is dead. You agree with that statement? No, no, I, I, I don't. I don't agree with this at all. And I've said, I've said that already. The press. I think that it'd be difficult to get somebody from a certain generation to to be able to relate to a different generation, you know. And you see. You know, I might be a 64-year-old metal head, but I feel like I've got a 16-year-old metal head's heart in me. Because I'm on the internet every fucking day, I'm on Instagram, I'm on the social website, I'm yeah. looking at all the different things that are happening. And it's buzzing, it's thrilling, it's exciting. And you keep There's up with the There's incredible things happening, you know. It's different to 1970, it's, it's sure different is. to 1980, it's different, it's 26, was it 2015, 2016, it's 2015, man, you know, try and think and look at and absorb and relate to what's happening now and not to the past, because the past is gone, the music's living forever, and I know it's easy to yeah. make comparisons, but to say that something is dead, I think is... Is, is just like a real kick in the balls to all the new bands that are desperately yeah. trying their hardest and their damnedest to do well and to be successful in rock and roll. So well I, I say far from it, Mark. I think it's alive. I agree. I think it's thriving, and I'm really excited about it for the I future. I think it's alive and kicking right here, brother. That's what it is, brother. It totally is. It totally is. All right, Rob, I don't want to take any more of your time. I want to thank you All so right, much. All right, Mark, it's for, been a great uh, conversation. Thank you so much. It's been great, man. And I really hope we, we, we cross paths again. Are we doing any more festivals while we're on the same deal? I be in uh, Barcelona. Oh, brilliant. Together okay, on great. That festival. I know, I know that's one for sure. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Other than that, I'm not quite sure. So, uh, But I'm sure we'll okay, see man. each other out there on the road somewhere. All right, brother. Well, I look forward to seeing you. Give my love to everybody in the I band. Will. You, and the uh, same. Safe, safe, travels, safe travels, and I hope to see you soon. Same to you, man. All right. See Take ya. Care, Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.